Hi, everybody. We'll just give people a few more seconds as they're joining us. Okay, welcome everybody to our RHA webinar on a changing climate and reproduction challenges and solutions. I'm Taylor Pinney. I'm a member of the RHA uh, Program and Activities Committee, and I'm going to be your host this evening. I just want to begin by acknowledging that I'm on the lands of the Wujuk Noongar people and acknowledge the ongoing importance of their elders past and present. And I encourage you to please take a moment to think about and recognise whose land you're on tonight. So if you're not familiar with RHA, RHA or Reproductive Health Australia is a unified voice for Australian researchers in reproduction, advocating directly to the community, opinion leaders and the government on behalf of the discipline. RHA's mission is to advocate for reproductive research in Australia, to promote awareness of the breadth and depth of knowledge and skills within this sector, and to ensure ongoing investment to support research into reproduction across livestock production, wildlife conservation, and human reproductive health. Now, if you're not an RHA member yet, I definitely would encourage you to join. RHA membership is free. So if you're not an RHA member yet, please do head over to the website at reproductivehealthaustralia.org.au and just click on the Become a Member tab. That membership will give you access to the quarterly RHA newsletter and it will also, of course, give you a heads up on future RHA events like this one. As you can see on the screen there, you can also find RHA across different social media platforms, including Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, and Instagram. So today we are talking about climate change and reproduction, and this ties into this year's Earth Day, which was April 22nd. The theme for this year's Earth Day is invest in our planet, which really highlights the importance of dedicating our time, resources and energy to solving climate change and other environmental issues. Investing in our planet is necessary to protect it, and it's the best way to pave a path towards a prosperous future. So no doubt our amazing speakers tonight will give you some more statistics in this area, but a couple that I just wanted to spin off to get us started. So 28 countries experienced their warmest year on record in 2022, including the UK, China and New Zealand. In addition, countries in Europe, as well as India and China, experienced record heat waves in 2022. Globally, oceans were the hottest ever recorded last year, and there is currently less sea ice surrounding Antarctica than at any time since measurements began in the 70s. As many of us know and lived through, 2022 was also a significant year for climate disasters, including extensive flooding in Pakistan and Australia and severe drought in Africa, coming close on the heels of our record-breaking bushfire seasons in Australia in 2019 and 2020 and in the US in 2020 and 2021. Of course, all of that seems like pretty dire news. So what's the good news in all of this? Well, if you've been keeping up with the news, the latest report by the UN IPCC released last month reported that a global warming target limit of 1.5 degrees Celsius is still achievable so long as we kick our responses into high gear now. We're starting to see that single-use plastic bins have real effects on both plastic consumption and the amount of plastic waste being removed in cleanup events. Green energy solutions are becoming increasingly efficient and affordable, and researchers are actively targeting solutions like feeding seaweed to reduce methane emissions in livestock. So with that context, uh, we've got a real treat tonight. We'll be hearing from three speakers who work on the effects of environmental change on reproduction in three very different areas, livestock, marine invertebrates, and humans. 
So with that, it is my great pleasure to invite Angela Lees up to the stage to present while she gets her slides organized. I'll give her a proper intro. So Dr. Sorry. Angela. No. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Angela Lees is a research scientist and lecturer in animal production science at the University of Queensland. Angela's research focuses on heat stress in agricultural animals. She's investigated the impact of heat stress on feedlot cattle, beef bulls, dairy cattle, and live export sheep. And Ange is going to talk about heat stress in livestock species. Where are we going? Take it away when you're ready, Ange. Thank you so much, Taylor, and thank you for the invitation to be here this evening. I have a small caveat. I'm sorry if there's any random background noises. My children are currently on dinner o'clock and there might be some random interruptions. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, so as Taylor said, I'm going to cover off on some of the livestock stuff. Um, I'm particularly focusing on those beef production systems. But the reality of it is, is that it's very similar across all of the industries. So we can kind of pick up the information that I'm presenting this evening and, and apply them across all of those primary livestock species. I didn't want to get too tied into um, the intricate details of heat stress. As Taylor said, I'm a heat stress physiologist, so that's my business. It's my stuff. I could talk about this for hours on end, but we're going to keep it short and sweet this evening. So I guess the, the few primary things that I want you to take away is that when it comes to environmental or thermal stresses, there's not really one mechanism in terms of animals that's not impacted by those thermal stresses. So it doesn't matter whether we're talking about reproduction like we are this evening, um, we can talk about growth and production status, we can talk about welfare, we can talk about housing. Um, we've been doing a lot of research in this for a really long time, um, and a lot of it actually comes out of the intensive animal industries. And like Taylor kind of alluded to, the real cascade around that was a number of mortalities that happened due to severe or um, quite profound heat wave events. And when we take that in context and put it into reality with the IPCC reports, the story doesn't look so great. Current trajectories, yes, we are capable of achieving that 1.5 degree target, but whether we actually achieve that or not is another question. So we kind of need to think about those more profound negative consequences. So we're looking at that plus four to plus six degree temperature change. The really interesting thing about that is that we talk about the temperature changes, but it's actually the average temperature change. So some of those swings on our upper maximums will look a lot different to a, a plus five, plus six degree temperature. The other thing that's really concerning, particularly for livestock species, is the increase in number of hot days over a period of time, or over the summer season, the length of the summer season, and also the intensity and severity of those heat wave events. Some of you might have seen um, the Kansas cattle feedlot cattle mortality event that happened in is that, I think that was last year. Um, my timelines are a little bit out, but that happened last year. And that, that was really driven by some of these climatic conditions. The other thing to think about too, is when we talk about heat and thermal stresses in animals in particular, we're not just talking about ambient temperature. We're talking about things like solar radiation, wind speed, relative humidity, and the temperature as well, and how they all come together and interact with that animal which is kind of, I've tried to depict that in this bit of an infographic that's here. So it's really important that we don't just look at ambient temperature, particularly for livestock species as we move forward, because we know that there's this interaction between all of those um, climatic variables. So if we come back to um, reproduction, um, this is some work that we've been doing over the last decade or so. Um, in summary, in terms of the impact of heat stress on production males, nothing is ever good that is reported. Every bit of information that comes out there, there's some form of negative consequence. We can look at it um, as basics as sperm morphology. We can look at it as the successful reproductive outcomes. It, it really doesn't matter which way you try to skim it. The data doesn't look good. Um, and that's really concerning. Um, 
I think the other thing that's really concerning is historically the way that we've actually tried to um, create simulated conditions so that we can understand the impact of heat stress is by using scrotal insulation techniques. Um, and the, the best and easiest way to do this is literally to get a newborn nappy and put it around the testis of a bull and basically elastoplast it there for a few days and, and put some data loggers in there and see how hot things get. But as you can imagine, um, there's some challenges with that because we're creating such a um, simulated and not real world situation. We don't actually know the dynamic that exists between how the whole body responds to climatic conditions and the impact that that actually has on reproductive capacity or function. So the work that we've been doing over the last 10 years or so is really trying to unpack and unravel some of this interaction between whole body heat exposure and the impact on male fertility. We haven't necessarily gone um, totally down the fertility path at the current moment in time, but what we have been able to identify is that by exposing the whole body to these heat challenges, we know that we get a rise in body temperature, which is our number one indicator that animals are suffering from heat stress. But what's also happening at the same time is that scrotal temperature is going up in conjunction with those environmental conditions as well as that body temperature. So we know that this, there's this um, disconnect and dysfunction that's happening through those hot periods and the severity of conditions also drive that. So this is um, what's really shown in these two figures here. Um, this is some really nice data from Andrea Wallage's PhD. And these are three, the three lines that are on here represent different severity of heat exposure. So one um, is sort of, standard hot conditions, so I wouldn't really call them hot. Um, we've got uh, acute, which is the gray squares, and then chronic, um, sorry, the other way. Acute is the, um, the black triangles and the chronic is your um, squares. So that's also really important because it's how animals manage and interact with short, sharp, severe heat in comparison to it's really hot for 10 days. So there's some balances there that, that have to come into play. And this is a part of the reason why that scrotal insulation technique might not necessarily be the best way forward to understand how much of an impact this terrible IPCC report is going to have on the future of reproduction and production animals. So this is some of my, my futures and, and where we're headed to from here. We, now that we know that we've got this model working, we, we have the capacity and ability to go forward and actually understand how this scrotal temperature regulation is impacting on that male fertility. Um, so one thing that we have been able to do from just a body temperature and a scrotal temperature perspective is what we're currently dubbing the hot nuts models. Um, so we might be able to have some forecasted trajectories to, you might wanna do something to protect your males in your population during this period of time because conditions are hot and it's likely to impact on your fertility outcomes. So that's the kind of direction that we're wanting to go in with this type of model and data with that whole body exposure. Um, a similar story for females. Um, there's a little bit of inconsistency in the information that's out there. Um, it's reflective of different production systems. It's reflective of different genotypes. It's reflective of lots of different things. But the things that are really quite consistent in terms of the impact of females is that we tend to see an increase in cycle length, that um, sexual receptivity period, particularly in pigs, is really reduced to instead of having like a 24 hour window, you've got a two hour window um, to successfully um, have population. So, and then the other things that we see there is that if we have um, severe enough conditions that we see an early degradation of that corpus luteum, so you get that early embryonic loss, there's also then some um, consequences there for developmental competence. We don't tend to see um, successful development of embryos, even if they are conceived, they tend to not um, continue and progress in development. And if you are pregnant, we see this impaired placental function. And this is one of the things that most animals do is when they get hot, what they'll do is they, the 
blood in the body, instead of being pushed around the body like it would normally to provide nutrients everywhere, they push a lot of the blood to the periphery. They want to send it to the body's surface to help liberate some of that heat from the body. So it's a cooling mechanism. So as soon as you do that, particularly when you're pregnant, you're taking nutrients away from that growing fetus towards um, trying to cool yourself. And so you get this impaired fetal um, growth, there's impaired nutrition supply there, and there's that impaired, impaired placental function. Hmm. So it's quite challenging and dynamic. So some of the other things that are happening in this space as well, um, so Jeffrey Dahl and Jim and Porter in the US have been working on a in utero heat stress programming um, scenario for the last, it's probably getting close to five to 10 years now. And what these guys have been doing is getting um, cows that are pregnant that are exposed to heat stress and following the lifetime story of progeny from those cows. So we know that heat stress to, to the maternal unit alone has some profound impacts for her production for that particular year. But what we didn't know was that that um, fetus also tends to have quite significant impacts on to their lifetime productivity. The really interesting thing that's coming out of their work is that from this, so for this image that's here, if you follow that fetus, a heifer, through to her first lactation and she doesn't receive any heat stress events, her progeny are still suffering the negative consequences from her in utero exposure. And that is looking, that's confirmed to the second generation and it's looking like it's present in the third generation as well. So these animals that have this great grandparent maternal exposure have a less productive phenotype. They don't produce as much milk. They have more negative health outcomes. There's a lot of memory tissue alterations. So the memory tissues just don't develop like a normal cooled cow, if we want to term them that. But they also have a, a really um, impaired immune system. So they don't seem to be able to cope with some of those negative health challenges that exist um, in, a, in a typical way. Um, there's also these sort of survival impacts. So um, if you're interested, I, it, we can certainly provide you with some more information. But what you see is that these cattle that or these heifers that have had this in utero heat exposure history, they're less likely to survive in the populations, whether it's they're being culled as first heifer calves for production, they're having too many health consequences, they're getting removed from these populations at a much earlier rate than what non-heat stressed animals are. So it's really showing us that there is some quite uh, interesting epigenetic responses that are happening in that in utero exposure. And traditionally, we always thought that it, that in utero exposure was a good thing because if you got exposed in utero, you typically had a level of thermotolerance. But we always knew that it had the consequence of a less productive animal. But we didn't realize that it maintained and stabilized in those populations or successive generations. So this is some really important work that's coming out. And with that, you know, that IPCC report, this is going to become a more prominent problem in production systems. I should add as well, we're seeing, we're definitely starting to see those sorts of things in the pig space as well. So what's happened is that in a lot of the heat stress literature, particularly for the livestock species, we have spent a lot of time looking at those intensively housed animals or intensively raised. So we're looking at the dairy industry, we're looking at pigs, we're looking at feedlot cattle. The other thing that we're looking at at the moment now, and this is a product of some of that work of Jeffrey Dahl and Jim Little Porters, is I'm actually starting to ask a lot of questions around what's happening in the grazing beef space. Because we don't we don't really have all that much information there. And then particularly from a female side of things, there's 
in the last couple of years, there's been some really nice data come out of South America, the US, showing us that these Bosinicus or Brahman type cows aren't as capable of regulating their body temperature as what we traditionally accepted, which means that they're not as thermally tolerant as we once thought they were. Some of that's going to be driven by selection pressures, but it also tells us that we need to understand what's actually happening in those populations because if we are now breeding towards a 2050 climate and we don't really know what that 2050 climate is going to look like, how do we select for animals today when we've only got one or two generations left to make really substantive change? Mm. And we're not sure what we actually need to select for, particularly in those grazing animals, because that's not just about the climate pressures that are on those animals. It's also some nutritional stresses. It's um, harsh conditions. It's walking to water. So some of these animals have to walk five kilometres to water. And the really big alarm bell that's there as well is what happens if our predictions are wrong or we are successful of achieving a one degree temp change? There's a lot of intricate details here that I think that we just simply don't know enough about at the current moment in time. And this is where we're starting to really purge into that space a little bit now. So where do we go to from here? Um, historically, we've sat down and we've all said, we know a lot about animals and we do, but we don't know enough. Um, and I think that I in particular am finding myself sitting down an awful lot lately and questioning the traditional norms. Because I think, and the, the Brahman story tells a quite, quite a nice picture around that as well, because we've failed to look at the Brahman because we've always accepted the Brahman as a thermally tolerant breed, but now we're seeing that they're not. So we need to know what are the conditions that they are in that drives their inability to cope with those climatic events and what actually, you know, are the result of those climatic events. So if we go back to the scrotal insulation story, a lot of that work's been done in Bosinicus bulls. So we know that they're going to be negatively impacted by those climatic conditions, but we've not really done the work in the female. So we don't know the nexus between both of them and particularly when both are experiencing those heat events together. We do need to spend a bit of time unpacking the differences between intensive and extensive industries. And that whole multiple stresses concept is really interesting. Um, some of our Indian colleagues, particularly Professor Sejian Virasamy, has been working in multiple stresses for about 10 to 15 years um, using a small ruminant model, so sheep and goats. And what they have found is that those multiple stresses actually places a greater or has a greater impact on reproductive outcomes in both males and females. So I suspect that as we turn our eyes towards the grazing industries, we will start to see some of these more um, multiple stresses approach become more um, required because it's really hard to isolate just these climatic events that are happening. So I think in the end, there's a like I said, I'm sitting down asking myself a lot at the moment whether we're actually asking the right questions and whether we've been doing the right things for the last 10 years because what we're seeing today isn't necessarily reflective of what we saw 10 years ago. So we've got a long way to go before we truly know everything about animals and how they interact with their thermal environment. But we've done a good job to get here. Um, and where we're going now is really important for future proofing the animal production industries moving forward. Um, and with that, I think that I'll, I'll stop it there. So I'd like to thank everyone again uh, and thank RHA for the invitation and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Eng. Thanks. Sorry uh, as, if I ran over time. <laughs> no, no, all good. As you suggested, if you've got any questions, please just use the Q&A function. Uh, we do have one sitting here from Lisa O'Donnell, who says, we know that epigenetic modifications in sperm can have heritable impacts in offspring, which goes to your point talking about these really cool 
effects that you're seeing, particularly in dairy cattle for multiple generations. You touched on the female side, but what Lisa wants to know is what do we know about heat stress and its effects on the sperm epigenome, particularly in agricultural species? I think it's a massive gap. Um, and I think we need to go there. Um, I was talking to uh, Mike McGowan about it the other day because I was like, ah, Mike, I think that we've forgotten about the man in this situation. <laughs> um, so I think it's it's another one of these sort of uh, divergent paths and new frontiers. We do need to do that. I think that there's probably a lot of learnings we could take from rodent models in particular. Mm -hmm. But I think in terms of the production industries, we, we need to do more in that space to get a better handle on what's happening, particularly in the male from that epigenome perspective. Absolutely. As you said, I think it's just one of those areas, like most male repro, this is the drum that I love to beat, most male repro likes to be ignored. So I think it's such an important aspect to be focusing on. Uh, one more question from Ray Rogers. So we might have large parts of Australia where we can't breed cattle. So do we breed in cooler areas and grow them in warmer areas? That's a really hard one to answer. Um, it would seem like the logical conclusion, but those cattle that we breed for cool climates aren't necessarily capable of surviving in those regions where we might not necessarily be able to. So a better approach might be identifying these resilient animals. And this is another one of these challenges that we're up with at the moment is that we've spent a lot of time thinking about how we've actually been defining terms. Mm. And so we talk about thermotolerance an awful lot, but I actually think we need to be talking about resilience and resilient animals, particularly when we want to breed animals in those northern environments. They've got to be resilient to the whole system. They've got mm. to be resilient to those nutritional restrictions, They've got to be resilient to the climatic constraints and they've got to be resilient to the production system. So I don't think it's as simple as just breeding cattle or sheep or goats in cooler conditions and, and shipping them out and growing them in these hotter regions. And the other side of that, is, and we didn't really cover off on it here because it's not relevant, but <laughs> the other side of that too is that growth and performance is really impacted by peak and hot weather. So taking those animals from cool environments and putting them in a hot environment and expecting them to grow isn't necessarily going to happen as well or as effectively if we stuck to a more resilient genotype. Certainly a tricky question. Don't think <laughs> yeah. we're going to solve it tonight. Not a chance. <laughs> Thank you so much, Anne, for that really lovely talk. Um, it's time for us to move on, though. So while Shauna gets set up, I will introduce her. So Dr. Shauna Fu is a marine scientist with an interest in the biology, ecology and evolution of marine ecosystems in a changing climate. During her career, she's used many fascinating technologies to understand the health and function of marine ecosystems. Her current research uses remote sensing, lab and field experiments to understand how coral reef health and associated fauna change in response to stresses and what factors increase the resilience of marine ecosystems to climate change. So Shauna is going to be talking today on broadcast spawning in a changing ocean. Whenever you're ready, Shauna. Thanks. Thanks, Taylor, for that introduction. Hopefully you can all hear me all right. Um, yeah, so as Taylor mentioned, uh, I'm a research fellow at Sydney Uni and my work looks at uh, the impacts of climate change all the way from microscopic scales up to reef and global scales. Um, but today I'll be focusing on these microscopic scales and talking to you about broadcast spawning in a changing ocean. Um, and just before I start, I would like to acknowledge the Darawal people, uh, the traditional owners of the land that I am presenting on today. And I would like to pay my respects to elders past and present and extend um, my respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people that are attending this webinar today. So uh, let's start with what is broadcast spawning. Um, it's basically uh, where animals shed their eggs and sperm into the sea. And so this is uh, one of the most common ways that animals will reproduce in the, in the ocean. And lots of animals do it. So. Uh, as shown in these pictures, hopefully you can see my pointer. Um, fish, uh, sea stars on the right here, sea urchins and coral, some of the most common animals that broadcast spawn. 
And as you can imagine, it's quite hard for the sperm and egg to meet up in the big white ocean. Uh, so a lot of these animals, for example, the, the fish and sea stars, they're going to release millions of sperm. Um, on the other hand, when you release eggs, there are a lot more energy, uh, cost a lot more energy to make. And so you'll release hundreds or thousands of those. And so, as you can imagine, the chances of meeting and fertilizing is very low in the ocean. And so uh, animals use a variety of environmental cues to make sure that they actually choose the right time and increase their chances. So they look at things like tidal cycle, water temperature, salinity, daylight, and um, most commonly moon cycles. And so a lot of corals and other animals will actually spawn um, in the full moon. They're quite romantic animals. And so by doing this, they increase the chances that they're all doing it at the same time and the egg is more likely to be fertilized. And so I mentioned, this is a most common mode of reproduction in the ocean. And so just to show the whole life cycle where this leads, so the adults will uh, shed their eggs and sperm into the water. They hopefully will fertilize and then develop through a variety of developmental stages that are quite similar to human development. They then quite, get quite different and they resemble these weird looking larvae, uh, which will swim around for weeks to months, um, eventually metamorphosing into something that uh, resembles that adult. So these are, this is a sea urchin here and a sea star. So just like um, you have a caterpillar becoming a butterfly, we see a similar process in the ocean. And then after many months or years, um, this whole they become reproductive and this whole cycle uh, repeats. Um, but with a changing ocean, you can expect that each of these life stages are impacted differently by um, all of these changes that we're expecting. And especially um, the impact on broadcast spawning and fertilization are most important because you know, they're, a, they're a bottleneck for the rest of in, uh, development. And so um, we're all aware of climate change, uh, and, but we not, might not be so aware of what's actually happening in the ocean. Um, and so with climate change, we're expecting a lot of bad things to happen. Uh, we're expecting sea level rise, uh, coral reefs bleaching, and most likely dying uh, with that one and a half degree Celsius increase, we're expecting to lose up to 70% of our coral reefs. Um, we'll see increases in things like toxic algal blooms, many other things, impacts on fisheries and the people that rely on them for sustenance. But uh, basically with all this excess CO2, um, with all of this heat, this global warming, the ocean's actually absorbing more than 90% of this excess heat. So we're seeing huge increases in temperature. Um, we're seeing changes in ocean circulation. So we're getting less oxygen in a lot of places. Um, and with this um, increase in CO2, the ocean is also absorbing the CO2 it's causing a change in a variety of chemical reactions. And as a result, the ocean is becoming more acidic or a term uh, called ocean acidification. And so um, I'll present some research in each, each of uh, the different uh, impacts of these factors on uh, um, different modes of reproduction. But before I introduce a bit of that research, I just wanted to introduce sea urchins as a model organism because this is the main animal that I work on and the research that I'll show you. So. Um, they're, they're a great model organism. They've been used since the 1800s to understand human development because the first 20 hours or so of sea urchin development is the same as human development. So they've been key to understanding processes like fertilization and blast blastulation. And then as pictured here, they're very easy to get gametes from. So this is, um, we're injecting a sea urchin here with like a muscle relaxant, and then we can either collect their eggs, they start releasing them into a beaker almost immediately, or you can pipette the sperm off the top and you can make babies at your convenience. And so they're a really, uh, really great uh, organism to work with. And there's no ethics problems either. So that's great. Um, so now that you know about sea urchin, some work that I've done has focused on the impact of climate change on the egg. And pictured here, I'm not sure if you've eaten sea urchin, but even the taste of this is changing with climate change. It's becoming you know, less tasty. I particularly don't like it. So even if it's changing, I can't tell. But some of the work that I have looked at is studying, um, is using extreme environments that reflect future ocean conditions as kind of a lab or window into the future. And so this video, oh, sorry, the bubbles are quite loud. 
Um, well, at least for me, uh, I don't know, hopefully you can see it, but there's a lot of bubbles rising from the sea floor. And so this is a CO2 vent area and they, I, um, they happen in areas of high volcanic activity. But just like fizzy drinks, these CO2 bubbles that are coming up from the sea floor are lowering the pH of the water and they're creating conditions that we expect to see with future ocean acidification. And so they're a really cool place to uh, look at animals that are surviving in what we expect to see in the future. And so in this case, I was interested in the sea urchins. And so these um, on the left are sea urchins living in normal conditions. And then right next to them in these bubbly areas, the CO2 uh, sea urchins living in these CO2 vents in low pH conditions. So I wanted to compare them. And in particular, I was really interested in a structure called the jelly coat. And so that's what's pictured here. Um, so we have the egg, they kind of look like fried eggs. And then this fuzzy um, white thing around the egg is the jelly coat. And, and weirdly enough, you can only see the structure when you add this black Japanese painting ink to the water and this structure suddenly becomes visible. And so this structure is important for many things. Some, some of them pictured on the right, but some of the main functions is you can see it greatly increases the egg target size, which you can expect is super important in the ocean when the sperm is just hoping to hit an egg. Um, so target size and also this egg jelly contains a lot of chemo attractants. So it helps the sperm actually smell out the egg and again, increase the chances of fertilization. So super important structure. And interestingly, this structure is known to dissolve in low pH. And so it's a structure that's you know, under threat with ocean acidification. And so I really, I wanted to compare the eggs of sea urchins that were living in these low pH vents uh, and compared them to the eggs of sea urchins from control conditions that are just living at normal uh, pH conditions and see what happens when we put these eggs in low pH water. And so what we found was, so when we look at control eggs, so eggs from sea urchins that have never seen low pH until we put their eggs in low pH, we found that the jelly coat immediately shrank and started to dissolve. Um, but we didn't find that when we look at uh, sea urchins from the CO2 vents. So you can see that jelly coat here indicated by the line um, just remained exactly the same when we put them in low pH conditions. The, the egg jelly coat didn't dissolve at all and wasn't affected. And it was just really cool to find this structure um, and that these sea urchins had actually adapted to low pH and retained this resilient structure and um, to help maintain normal fertilization in low pH conditions. And so it does give some hope that some animals are able to maintain normal reproductive processes under stress. Um, and so now we'll move to the other side of the coin, which is the impacts of climate change on sperm. And so sea urchin sperm is super small. This is about, I think it's like one micron. And on the left, you see this video, this is them swimming around. And luckily we have lots of computer assisted programs that can help um, track their behavior and draw it out for us so we can understand what's going on. And so when we expose sperm um, to low pH conditions or changes, increases in temperature, we start to see weird things. So um, on the right, we're seeing all these circular tracks. They start swimming with no purpose. Um, and we can see these arrows, these are actually pointing to sperm that have pretty much done nothing. They've stayed in the same place and haven't really moved. And so they're not really being activated properly. And so when we expose the sperm to these conditions we expect to see in the future, they start performing, swimming badly, they're immotile or higher percentages of um, immotile sperm. And so with that, we can expect to see flow on impacts to fertilization and have less success in fertilization. And so then that brings me to um, impacts of climate change on fertilization itself. And so here again, we have sea urchin eggs. It's a little video. You can see little black specks of sperm maybe um, around, but you can see as soon as that egg is fertilized, you get this beautiful fertilization envelope appearing um, in comparison to the egg on the right that doesn't get fertilized at all. So you can see how easy it is to assess successful fertilization in sea urchins. And so for this, research, I was really interested in looking at how fertilization was impacted by increases in temperature and decreases in pH and comparing those impacts across four common species in Australia. And so um, the scientific names are uh, shown with them, but it's just easiest to recognize them by their colors and their distributions are shown on the right. So for example, you can see that white urchin is um, a tropical urchin mainly found in Queensland. And this, this black urchin here, this is the most common with its distribution shown in green. 
uh, is the most common urchin you'll see if you go swimming or snorkeling in Sydney, for example. Um, and interestingly, you can see all four urchins actually uh, are found in Sydney. So it's a, a good way to experiment, do experiments with them and compare their responses of all four of them. And so what we found when we uh, fertilized eggs under increased temperature and decreased pH scenarios, it was differing impacts. So for example, for this white urchin and this black urchin, we found that fertilization was much less when they're exposed to decreased pH. But on the other hand, for this purple urchin, fertilization success is only impacted by increases in temperature. Um, we then have this red sea urchin that was a superstar and there was just no impact of increased temperature or decreased pH on fertilization success. <clears throat> and so the main takeaways from this is that these species that we found all in the same area responded completely different to the same scenarios. And so we can expect this to have flow and impacts um, you know, for species distributions and populations in the future. We're gonna see some winners and losers. Um, but it is not all doom and gloom. There are solutions that are being explored um, and ways to help preserve reproduction in the changing ocean. And so this isn't research that I'm directly involved in, but um, really cool research that's happening around Australia and the world. So one thing that's been looked at is coral cryopreservation. So this on the left is some coral eggs and they've been able, it's been it's, over the past 10 years, they've figured out how to freeze them and store them and defrost them so that they're still viable. Um, just like there's a biobank, I think of seeds and trees in Norway or Sweden somewhere, they're doing the same thing with coral. And um, in Taronga now they have more than 30 species of the Great Barrier Reef corals. And they also have um, heat tolerant gametes uh, also frozen. So they've actually been able to collect eggs and sperm from corals that have survived bleaching and they've frozen them um, in the hope to grow new stress resilient corals in the future. So another solution that's been explored is larval seeding. And so this uh, structure on the left, uh, these are little people for scale you can see sitting on the structure. So this like orange slick is a bunch of sperm, eggs, um, fertilized eggs and coral larvae that are all being concentrated in a region of ocean that has degraded reef. And so they're hoping by you know, concentrating all of this rather than letting ocean currents um, mix, take them away, um, they can help more of these larvae metamorphose and settle and help restore some of that coral um, in that area where it's died. Um, on the same vein, there's uh, these coral structures that have been made. So on the right, uh, uh, we can see this is a really newly settled coral juvenile. So they've kind of um, you know, gone past that really fragile process of broadcast spawning, fertilization, larvae, and they've um, been able to settle these juveniles onto these structures, and they will settle a few, few, there's another one here, and then they can plant these out onto degraded reefs and hope that um, that can also help increase uh, coral cover in those areas. So the last uh, solution that's been, that I'll talk about, that's been explored is coral IVF. Um, and again, this is kind of, assisting evolution. They're, they're taking eggs and sperm, again, from more stress resilient corals, corals that have either survived bleaching or they've also created in the lab um, these super corals that are more heat tolerant or low pH tolerant. And they're using those eggs and sperm to make these super corals, um, which they're growing in the lab. So this is up at the Australian Institute of Marine Science in Townsville. And they can grow these. And then these are uh, super corals that can be outplanted onto degraded reefs and hopefully survive the next heat wave events um, and help again restore some of that coral that's lost. Um, so while these, while these solutions are all very heartening, uh, the main thing that we can do is cut CO2 emissions to preserve our beautiful marine ecosystems and ensure that broadcast spawning you know, happens as, as normally as it can. And with that, I really uh, thank you for listening and we'll take any questions. Thank you so much, Shauna. Again, if you've got any questions, please use the Q&A function, pop them in there. Um, while we wait, I do have a question. Um, love that you mentioned freezing coral eggs and sperm as well. I know it must be fairly challenging because of the size of the gametes, um, because you know they're sort of visible to the naked eye, but amazing that it's happening. Anyway, yeah. my, <laughs> my question is about, um, I guess it, it's, as you said, it's very heartening 
and sort of a cause for hope that you saw those sea urchin eggs that came from these sort of adapted uh, urchins that were in this, these acidic environments. Yeah. Being able to cope with that sort of more extreme stress. What I'm wondering is, do you think that it's likely then that marine invertebrates are going to be able to adapt to a changing ocean or are the changes that are happening really too quick for them to catch up? Um, it's not uh, only for some species. So we're, we're yeah. seeing uh, for, unfortunately, a lot of the more weedy or invasive species that they tend to be more likely to adapt. Um, yeah. Even for corals, there are corals that could be considered even the more weedy types. They're not as mm -hmm. special types, but even with corals, you're finding some of those are more likely to adapt or they're okay. Um, there's actually corals even found in some of these low pH vent systems. Right. Yeah. So there is hope for some. It's just not going to be um, that same diversity yeah, that we see now. Yeah. Which I guess is also reflective of what you found with the other urchin work as well, right? That there are species all have sort of different tolerances to the, the same con changing conditions as well. Yeah. And and for those, that sea urchin study I showed, that was, um, you know, they've been exposed to these low pH conditions for about 30 years. So that's yeah. pretty quick ish you know they've been exposed to that and have been able to adapt to specific structures so there is yeah there's definitely some species that will be okay yeah amazing um if you've got any questions feel free to shoot them through uh otherwise we might move on and go into the realm now of humans thank you so much shauna no worries while Celia gets set up, I will introduce her. So Professor Celia Roberts is a sociologist in the School of Sociology at the Australian National University. Celia researches the social and ethical aspects of human reproduction and teaches gender and feminist theory, research methods and post-human studies. She's recently written a book with three colleagues about women who had babies during the 2019-2020 bushfires in the ACT and Southeast New South Wales. She's also working on understanding younger people's feelings about reproduction in climate crisis. She's the author of several other books about sex hormones and gendered embodiment, health self-tracking and early onset puberty. She's currently working on the translation of epigenetics into antenatal care. She's talking today about how is the climate crisis impacting human reproduction in Australia, a sociological perspective. Whenever you're ready, Celia. Thank you. Taylor, it's really lovely to be here and to hear those amazing talks and my mind's already exploding with what the connections are between, yeah, urchins, cattle and humans. Anyway, uh, so just to start with acknowledgement of country, I'm coming to you from Canberra, Ngunnawal, Ngambri country, um, and just want to acknowledge uh, that sovereignty has never been ceded and to pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging and really to acknowledge the incredible significance of ongoing connection to country and care for country, um, particularly in the context of fire, um, bushfires, which we've been reading a lot about um, in the literature. So um, just the broader context in the most widely, you know, gen general statements, we all know this probably, but just to take us to where we are amidst climate change, um, rising involuntary infertility in humans, alongside rising voluntary childlessness or child freeness, as some people put it, in many countries. And of course, that contributes to aging populations, um, a fear of increasing instabilities, environmental instabilities and economic instabilities, and also changing social patterns in relation to sex gender and the whole idea of sexual difference in the, sex, the gender binary or the sex binary um, sort of being currently exploded in so many ways and family formations or who gets to have families when, when they have families, um, you know, uh, how people living together, living apart, et cetera. So it's this kind of incredible concurrent set of changes that are happening at the same time as climate change. I just want to point out just... I mean, this is Googling uh, Australia's 2022 fertility rate is 1.79 live births per woman. So we're already in Australia underneath uh, replacement levels. 
So I want to talk about a project that I've just finished and um, this book is coming out in the next couple of months, um, which is a book I've written with colleagues there, which as uh, Taylor said, is a book about people who were pregnant or had a newborn baby during the 2019-2020 bushfires in the ACT and southwest New South Wales. Um, so this is was a really, we're already thinking about reproduction uh, and kin, which is just family relations and climate crisis. And then suddenly the bushfires happen. We thought this is an amazing case study to explore these connections. Obviously extreme um, dangers of climate crisis as you, anyone who's living in Australia at the time was suddenly and deeply aware, was suddenly with us. This thing that was going to be coming and might be visible in sea urchins was suddenly visible literally outside your window, uh, particularly in Canberra. So it was uh, sudden, extreme and frightening. Exposure to smoke, uh, evacuation from fire and threat to life and housing. So what the way we talk about things like this or study them is we do interviews with people and this also COVID happened immediately as we were starting this study. So we did a lot of Zoom interviews, very inconvenient. And talking with parents, mostly mums, but also some fathers and other experts in this space, clinicians, um, scientists, architects, uh, firefighters, etc. And our sociological study is associated with another uh, study being led out of ANU, um, where I'm situated which is a biomedical study about the impacts of bushfire smoke on mothers and babies. That's called Mother and Child 2020. Um, the results of that are still being processed. Um, so I can't really tell you much about that, but what's important to note is that not much is known about the effects of bushfire smoke on babies, um, fetuses or mothers. And that's what that study, they're gonna track babies over the next five years at least. So um, the other thing we ask people to do is give us photographs of their worlds uh, during the time of the fires. So when you see photographs here, these are also data for us. Um, people just, we said, give us photos that don't have people in them. Um, so lots of pictures of smoke and some really amazing pictures of fire. Um, what did people say about being pregnant um, at this time? So I'm just gonna uh, share some quotes. So just to say that, um, you know, Canberra, some of you will know, did have a massive local fire, though it wasn't in the city. Um, our local national park, Namaji National Park, 80% uh, of that burnt, which is still in, you know, hugely devastated condition, and 22% of the Titimbilla uh, Nature Reserve. So even though people felt like the fires weren't here in some sense because they weren't in the city as they had been in previous decades, um, they were right here. And the smoke situation, we were at various times in that period, we had the worst um, air quality in the world. Um, so this is an interesting person speaking about um, her experiences of fire living in Canberra. And I, we just find this sort of amusing because people are talking about this sense of Canberra being untouchable, that it's a mild place to live. And suddenly, as I was saying before, there's this really frightening, scary um, experience of climate change coming right at you. Um, and this idea about the Canberra bubble, um, talking about socio-demographics and an affluent little community, we should be able to do whatever we want. Um, and suddenly this didn't happen. Um, and I've, you know, I've got, I'm young, I've got a lot of life to live. And I look at my kids, I'm like, God, how are you going to manage? Like, what are you going to have to deal with in your lifetime that's already happening now? So we're doing this pro project, as I said, in the context of COVID, it was pretty hard to recruit um, participants. So a lot of our, almost all of our participants were uh, highly educated Canberra uh, professionals. But what was really interesting to us was this sense of um, the way in which physical precarity was a shock to, pe to privileged people. They weren't, they were used to being able to buy their way out of trouble and people tried to buy their way out of this trouble, but um, you know, there were times when there was nowhere to go. Um, so this sense, I think this highlighted to us that the significance of what these changes might mean to less privileged people who weren't willing or able to speak to us at this time, but um, you know, even really privileged people were scared and um, frightened about the future and the current situation. Um, for a lot of people, um, when we asked them about how they felt about climate change and sort of climate futures and how that would infect, uh, impact their uh, ideas about having children, these are all people who'd recently had a child, a bit of a tricky question to ask, but we thought we should ask it anyway. Um, some of them said, no, it wouldn't affect my uh, future 
um, decisions, but others would say, yeah, yeah, it really has because of this encountering this fear and all the work they had to do in trying to um, contain smoke um, during pregnancy and then for their babies. And this woman, I think, is really interesting. She's talked, she uses the language of net zero and combines that with an idea about replacement population, saying, um, you know, uh, we used to think, oh, we might have two, three, whatever. And so now we're like, no, we're done, two in, two out, net zero. Um, climate change in the world actually becoming sick and not being sustainable. So are you going to put children into it? Like maybe that's a selfish thing to do. I guess I was thinking, I was listening to the other two, I mean, this is probably a big distinction between cows and sea urchins and humans, is that humans have this incredible awareness and make decisions about reproduction. Reproduction is something we choose to do, um, and that really um, has a huge impact on, on um, what actually the effects of climate change are on people. It's not just what happens to their bodies, it's what happens to their thoughts and their decision making. Um, oops. So we uh, also talked to men, as I said, um, and I think this was a really um, important theme in some of the interviews, and I'm sure a lot of us can relate to this. And again, this is quite a privileged position, but thinking about, is there somewhere else to go? Uh, you know, where will be the best place to live? Should uh, Is there a place that can be insulated from the various extremes? Like, how can we think about this? But of course, and it's a classic um you know, middle-class person. He's thinking we probably won't move like that for several years, but it's definitely in my consciousness. And I imagine such places will start to have a much higher attraction. So ideally you want to get in before the property values go up, you know, and it's kind of amusing at one level, but on the other hand, you think this incredible sense of needing to run away and actually the sort of shocking realisation for many of our participants that there was nowhere to run. Um, or the, in this particular case, these people ran to Melbourne um, and then ended up in the world's longest lockdown. So, um, you know, there's no safe place to hide. Um, so what about people who don't have children or don't yet have children? Um, what are their thoughts? So this is a more recent study, a current study. We're talking to young people and um, the sort of older end of young people because we want to talk to people who might actually be thinking about having kids, not in some sort of realistic way. So 25 to 35 year olds. Um, and we did this project, these projects with our students and we got them to run in interviews as peers, which was really interesting because, um, you know, talking to 50 year olds is different to talking to 25 year olds. Um, and we found that um, the young people that were willing to come and talk who didn't have children, they weren't necessarily uh, environmentalists, some of them were, but we tried to focus on the non-standard uh, participants in social research, men, LGBTIQ plus people, and people with lower education levels to sort of balance out um, some of our, our earlier work. And it was really significant how often people were thinking and how deeply people were thinking about the impacts of climate change and climate reduction. Um, so this is Kirsten, Kristen, sorry, um, who is an Aboriginal woman um, from northern New South Wales who described herself as asexual. And she's sort of saying, well, you know, we could actually feed everyone. I and mean, she had this very critical analysis, very sociological analysis. We've got resources just because people in Western countries use more resources than they need. And here, I think really importantly, she's pointing out that that's mostly a racist dog whistle, which I think is an amazing phrase. Um, that actually it's people with smaller families who are costing more for the environment. And she says, I don't care about the fact that it's falling because the only real reason I've seen to do that is just to improve the economy. So really a very politicised understanding of um, reproduction. And of course, as she says, and this is an important point, the other way to increase population if we're worrying about declining population is to take in more refugees. But we don't want to do that if it's because those people are the wrong colour. She's being ironic there, obviously. Um, another woman, uh, a cis woman, pansexual mental health support worker, she's again talking about people had this very uh, complex sense of world global population. We've hit this thing. People are living longer, but we've got this aging population. She's like, I don't want to say we should be killing people off. Um, that's not what I'm saying. It's just that we're reproducing so much faster than we ever have before. And I don't, I don't want to contribute. So some of these young people, quite a few of them, had a really strong sense of sort of blowing up population, ever-increasing population, and the sense that it would be irresponsible of them um, to participate in that. 
she goes on to say, like, I don't want, you know, chagrin people for having children because this is the desire. And she mentions this, that when she was 27 for two weeks, she felt she might have a natural desire to have a baby, um, told her partner and thought it was going to go away. And it did. So that was good for her. She says, I don't, I don't want to talk about it. I don't want to tell people not to have children, um, but it worries me. It's just so scary. I don't think any child should get the anxiety and fear that I would feel as a mother to want to protect this child. Why would I want to bring them into the world in this current state? So this really what she calls an existential conversation about fear, anxiety, and what sort of a world is a child going to be brought into, which is a pretty tough thing to be thinking about. So um, to summarise... People who already have babies in the bushfire study express really strong concerns about the future, but as um, educated and quite empowered people, they often said, but my kids will be, will be part of the solution, not part of the problem. They're going to be eco-warriors and I'm going to bring them up in a good way to care about the environment. However, many stated that climate crisis had had an effect on their thoughts about family size and where they might live. People who did not yet have children, however, in contrast, express really strong worries about climate crisis and what the next generation will face in particular. So they're not so much worried about population. They're more likely to be worried about what kids would experience. Um, and interestingly, um, women were more worried about this than men. And one of our really interesting findings with the group of men we talked to is that most of them were delegating re reproductive decisions to their female partners. They said, well, if she doesn't want to have kids, I won't. But if she does, I'll do it. Um, and many of them have this critical idea about overpopulation. So what the hell should we do? Um, where we would advocate that we need to think, bring issues of climate crisis into sex and relationships education and to bring up this connection between reproduction and climate throughout the curriculum. And obviously the scientific curriculum would be really great for that. Provide spaces for public debate and really importantly, intergenerational discussion. And I think RHA is doing this, which is great. Um, I would say as a sociologist and listening to my interviewees that we need to address social inequalities, including the legacies of colonisation, obviously, and climate crisis as connected processes. It doesn't make sense to think of those separately um, because they both matter and they co-evolve. And more specifically in relation to bushfires, it was really clear to us that people had not thought about what should happen to pregnant women and newborns in evacuations. I don't know so much about flooding, but I'm guessing the same is um, happening. You know, services broke down, the hospitals were full of smoke and people didn't get the services they needed um, to help them look after babies. So that's a sort of much more practical thing that we need to be thinking about doing. Okay. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Celia. Very different and yes. so interesting always, I think, to get that perspective that's just very different from if you're a bench scientist yes. most of what we hear and talk about every day so again if you've got questions for Celia just pop them through on the Q&A um, we've got one here from Ray Rogers that says given that 50% of pregnancies are unplanned and parts of the world still don't have adequate uh, contraception or education are we really that different to sea urchins <laughs> <laughs> yes well that's interesting isn't it um yeah, I mean, I guess this is part of who we're talking to. I mean, this mm -hmm. is always a problem with social research that you recruit people who've got time and, if you know, are able to take the time. And we, you know, we do all sorts of ways of trying to pay people for their time mm -hmm. to try and recruit people from different kinds of cohorts. But, um, yeah, we were speaking to the planners. Yeah. I think it would be super interesting to... Uh, get in touch with people or to try and get more of stories from people who weren't mm -hmm. um because not and that's again where social class and climate change go together because even in Canberra the suburbs that are lower SES had more smoke because mm. of the way the land lies so there's really interesting ways in which those things um coincide and then once we get into epigenetics you know there'd be a whole nother set of factors that um but influence but yeah it's a good question yeah absolutely so I guess so, sort of following on from this is just a, a question of mine what I'm interested to know is whether any of your research has sort of touched on this nexus of climate change and reproduction but in couples dealing with infertility and whether their thoughts and experiences are, are quite different yeah 
No, I, I, that is a really interesting question because I've done a lot of work on infertility sort of outside the climate change space. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it, it is very, very different. And I think um, we're just thinking about work I've done on people who have um, genetic high chance of having a child with a genetic disease, a fatal mm -hmm. genetic disease, you know those people have a really, really different sense of the sort of value of babies and because they have to, it's so hard to, you know, achieve a pregnancy for the healthy baby yeah. and are often willing to accept children with disabilities and difficulties of all sorts that, you know, well, if they're not going to die, that's good. You know, they have a different, yeah. they set the bar in a really different place. Yeah, absolutely. So, well, I think it's, I think it would be really, really interesting to talk to people with infertility um about their thinking about climate change mm -hmm. um, i think they're probably it's a really really tough space Absolutely. you really want a kid you struggled really hard to get one and then you're concerned about what their life's going to be like yeah change i mean you know my heart goes out to them really absolutely you know, talk about triple whammy yeah yeah so we've got one last question here from Angela Crean, who says, talking of privilege, what an incredible privilege to learn from the wisdom of four incredible women. I've done nothing, so I'm not going to take any credit. <laughs> um, but Angie's wondering, did any of the participants actually mention their concerns about climate change impacting their ability to reproduce? So are people aware that mm -hmm. things like climate disasters might actually be impacting their reproductive physiology? Well, what was so interesting about the bushfires was that women were told, pregnant women were told they were vulnerable and there was public yeah. health campaigns saying you're vulnerable, stay inside. You know, this is before masks, wear a mask. People were taping up their windows and their doors, you know, hovering over, buying air purifiers, hovering over those. But there was never any, it wasn't clear what that was actually about. Yeah. And that's, you know, hence the study. So I think in the bushfire case, people were really willing to take that seriously and to think this really will affect my baby, maybe not about conceiving, but, you know, the he the future health of their baby. Um, but they, this is still taking place in a vacuum. I don't, I don't think people know yet, but I think there will be a very interested, people will be very interested to know when that research comes out. I mean, placenta is one thing. Um, one of you mentioned placentas, I think the cows, but um, there was a lot of concern about smokers' placentas. Because mm. you know, middle class women know they're not supposed to smoke in pregnancy and they didn't and they were diligent about that. And then they had babies and thought or were told that their placentas looked like they'd smoked a pack a day kind of thing. Mm. So that was a really haunting, horrible feeling of being unable to act but to protect the health of the placenta and therefore the child. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, definitely. I'll be keeping an eye out for the results of the study you were talking about with the sort of more long term effects on the uh, on the children as well. Yeah. OK. If, I, if you don't mind, Taylor, I can just add a little bit yeah. to that. So absolutely. It's, it's some of the comments that Celia's had are quite interesting. Um, and from a paediatrics perspective, from in utero growth, growth restriction fetuses, mm -hmm. the heat stress sheep model is what they use to model model that for a pediatric model. So mm -hmm. because of the, the changes in placental function and also some of the dietary restrictions that happen, or dietary changes, I shouldn't call them restrictions, that happen in a heat stress situation, mm -hmm. there's a, a lot of those sort of growth confa um, confounding factors and that placental restriction that happens is a beautiful pediatric model. And uh, mm -hmm. there's a lot of stuff that comes out in the ped space that use a, an animal heat stress model to model those sort of impacts and circumvent them in in the neonate. Yeah. So it's there's a, a there's probably a really interesting nexus there. And I think um, in terms of in women's reproductive health moving forward, I, I, heat heat is probably going to have some profound impacts as we walk down this climate change path. It's made me realise listening to you that. I mean, I don't know whether my medical colleagues are talking about heat, but we've been talking about smoke the whole time and mm. stress of evacuation and not heat. And yet there was intense heat. I guess we assume that people can get out of heat. But one of mm. the findings was that, um, you know, lots of Canberra houses in particular are not um, suitable for bushfires because they use evaporative cooling, which mm. brings in smoke. So people actually had to turn off their cooling system. So people were enduring, pregnant women were enduring huge like over 45 day after day after day. And I, I'm not sure whether they're looking at that, but yeah, I think the heat stress, we'll think about the 
western suburbs of Sydney you know it's going to be routinely too hot isn't it so um yeah I think that's really the centers and heat it's really important area to think about yeah Absolutely. So many opportunities to collaborate, bring more yes. people into the ag livestock space. Yes. All These right. I have placentas. That's now what I'm thinking. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so yeah. I will wrap up this evening by saying a huge thank you to our three presenters, Angela, Shauna and Celia, for their really wonderful talks and, and insights tonight and for everyone for attending. We really hope you enjoyed it and learned something. I certainly did. Um, what I do want to spruik just at the end is to keep an eye out for the new sparkly RHA website that is coming soon. Um, as I said at the beginning, don't forget to sign up for a free membership if you're not already a member of RHA and do follow RHA on social media as well so you don't miss out on more events like this. Thank you so much everybody. I hope you have a wonderful evening. Thank you all so much. Thank you.